I think we're, we're, we're going to get started. Um, let me uh, just, on behalf of um, uh, Congressman Van Hollen, I, I'm Bill Parsons. I work for Congressman Van Hollen. He's one of the co-chairs, along with uh, Roscoe Bartlett um, uh, and my colleague Lisa Wright. Say hi. Hello. <laughs> and uh, uh, we want to welcome you and, and uh, really glad you took the time out to be here. The uh, House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, just a few words about it. It's been around since 1996. Uh, makes it one of the older uh, congressional caucuses, uh, uh, sort of ongoing, uh, running on an ongoing basis. Also one of the largest. Um, we say, we, technically we say we're bipartisan. I like to say we're nonpartisan. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a forum for discussion about uh, the, the state of uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency as regards the industry, as regards um, uh, policy and so forth. Um, we have uh, uh, two uh, primary um, tools that we use to communicate with our membership. Uh, it's, it's a weekly um, uh, events calendar and, uh, and a, a weekly uh, a clipping service to stay current. Um, the, the membership uh, as of today, I'm proud to tell you we have 157 members. Um, representing 39 states, a district of Columbia, and three territories. Uh, we're always looking for more, uh, and Lisa will say a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, we we uh, historically have done two events, two marquee events a year. This is the first. The annual budget briefing is the first. I always like it because um, you kind of uh, are following things with the clip service and the events and so forth, and, and the budget uh, uh, release and the briefing around it gives us our, our first kind of benchmark uh, to chew on, uh, and uh, to react to uh, and, and, frankly, to plan, plan going forward. Uh, and I must tell you, just this year, uh, uh, Carol Warner, who works with EESI, uh, with whom we, we often partner on events, as well as other outside groups, Sustainable Energy and Coalition and so forth, will be introducing our, our panelists in greater depth. But I'm really pleased, um, uh, Fred and Henry and Scott, that you took time out uh, again this year to join us and to share your expertise with us. I'm uh, really honored that, that, that you're here. Um, with that, so uh, I'm going to leave this, I'm going to turn it over to my, um, my co-conspirator here, Lisa Reip, uh, uh who's got a, a few uh, words of encouragement for uh, caucus membership. Hi, thank you and welcome. Um, it was actually the first time for this particular Congress in 2012 that for the first time, this nonpartisan caucus, which has a structure of having co-chairs from each of the major parties and uh, two vice chairs from each of the major parties, um, ended up having co-chairs from the same state. And that was just a, a, as a part of a, the general evolution of leadership within the caucus. Congressman Bartlett joined the caucus I can't even remember when. Uh, but after being an active member for many years, he was invited and stepped up to the plate to a junior leadership position of being vice chair. And at the end of the 111th Congress, the, the, the chairman, the veteran chairman is Congressman Chris Van Hollen, um, who's our neighbor from the 8th District of Maryland. And at the end of that Congress, started this Congress, um, Congressman Bartlett was the last leader standing among the Republicans. and so. Um, was very honored to join Congressman Van Hollen as co-chairman. You know, every Congress we start over new, we have about 90 new members of the 112th Congress of our 435. And members come in and they, they don't know what tools are available to them to sort through the deluge of information that we receive. And the, the, the much um, often touted information that gets a lot, most of the attention, are interpretations of, well, facts are not a part of most of the material and information that come to members of Congress. It's their point of view. The Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus exists as a forum for sharing facts. That is why we're here. That's why we consider ourselves to be nonpartisan. That is why um, I'd like to put you on the spot, if I may. Would you raise your hand if you are congressional staff? I won't put you on the spot if you are not currently, 
a member of the caucus, but I would strongly encourage you to join. If your boss has any interest in helping his constituents to save money, because that's what you do through energy efficiency, if your boss has any interest in advancing domestic sources of sustainable energy, I would encourage you, have your boss join the caucus because what you will get is a steady resource supply of facts upon which your boss can base his or her decisions about energy. And with that pitch, um, I also want to add to what Bill said that we are so grateful to be able to partner often with Carol Werner, who's the executive director of the Energy and Environment Studies Institute. And for many years now, this particular briefing is the premier briefing that is open to every member of Congress, every member of staff, providing historical perspective as well as the current provisions in the actual budget of the president, every president, whichever president, concerning renewable energy and energy efficiency. And we're grateful that we have the dedication and the involvement and the time commitment of Henry Kelly from the Department of Energy and Scott Sklar from the Sustainable Energy Coalition, who was at one time a Senate staffer, and also Fred Sassine from the Congressional Research Service, without which Congress would be um, quite, quite, quite. Lost. Thank you. And with that, I don't want to take any more time. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Lisa. And if you'd like to join the caucus, it's really simple. You just send an email to bill.parsons, P-A-R-S-O-N-S, at mail.house.gov, and or lisa.right, L-I-S-A dot W-R-I-G-H-T, at mail.house.gov, and just simply say, please add representative so-and-so as a member of the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. And there's no time commitment on the part of your boss. It's just you get access to an incredible resource. But you also get, your boss also gets to tout being a proponent of energy efficiency and renewable energy. And that's a good thing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bill and Lisa. And uh, speaking for EESI, it has always been um, a wonderful honor uh, to be able to work closely with, with, um, with both Bill and Lisa and um, Mr. Bartlett and Mr. Van Hollen in terms of looking at the whole role of the caucus and helping them get solid information out. And one of the other key things that we all do together as well uh, in conjunction as, and as part of the Sustainable Energy Coalition is an expo, a technology expo and policy forum, which this year will be held all day on June 21st in the Cannon Caucus Room. And so you can talk to any of us with, with regard to that event too, which we all co-sponsor. So at this time, as you heard from both Bill and Lisa, this briefing is specifically designed to really take a look at the budget, the uh, upcoming budget for 2013 that has been proposed by the administration with regard to the role of renewable energy and energy efficiency, particularly at the Department of Energy. So the budget for uh, renewables and efficiency encompasses many different sectors and uh, different approaches. It is something that is uh, that many of us look at very, very carefully every year in terms of thinking about what this means for overall policy. Energy is the lifeblood of this country. We are seeing enormous changes. It is absolutely integrated into so many other aspects of our society and our economy. I think it is both really important to understand all of those linkages and it is also very exciting to understand all those linkages and how you can address multiple uh, issues, objectives, all at the same time by uh, looking at the role of energy. 
and how it is used. So we're going to hear from three speakers this afternoon. We will hear from them first before we open it up for Q&A. I also just want to mention that, that after the briefing uh, this afternoon, we will be posting all the presentations on EESI's website. So um, feel free to go there and also share it with your, your colleagues as well. Um, our first speaker this afternoon to walk us through the DOE budget request for the Office of Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency is Dr. Henry Kelly, who is the Acting Assisting Secretary for Renewables and Efficiency. And uh, Dr. Kelly brings uh, an unbelievable amount of uh, experience in terms of looking at energy and being involved in terms of energy technology, uh, uh, scientific research, and policy. Uh, I first met Henry uh, back when he was with the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment. He also had been at the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, former president of the Federation of American Science Scientists, and has been now with the DOE leading this work for several years. So uh, without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Kelly. Thank you, Carol. Uh, one of my uh, other claims to fame is that I'm a longtime Carol Warner uh, <laughs> fan. Uh, so I want to thank uh, ESI and the, um, uh, the caucus, and uh, particularly Congressman Bartlett, Congressman Von Holling, for putting this together. Uh, I guess we're up and running here. So I am going to be talking about energy efficiency and renewable energy. It's a complicated portfolio. You can see that this topic is actually very central to the administration's overall priorities for a lot of reasons. The President talked about all of the above energy strategy. Uh, we're not all of the above, but we like to think we're some of the most important parts of the above. We're a very diverse portfolio, lots of things which are highly cost competitive, and we do, in fact, as was said, touch every part of the American economy, whether it's construction or automobile manufacturing or uh, electric utilities. Uh, this, this is uh, the, the clean energy technologies we think are really one of the major drivers of the U.S. economy, in addition, of course, to solving uh, crucial national security and environmental challenges. So just a, an immediate tutorial on this thing, you know, you say, well, we worry about both where the energy goes and how we supply the energy that we continue to need. And so just in brief, about 40 percent of all the energy used in the U.S. goes to buildings, commercial buildings and residential buildings, with the rest are roughly equally divided between manufacturing uh, and uh, transportation. If you look at uh, where the electricity goes, however, you can see that it is overwhelmingly dominated by what happens in buildings. Over 70 percent of all electricity goes into commercial or residential uh, buildings, so most of it goes to things that we're very familiar with, it's like lighting and heating. Uh, with the petroleum, of course, it's a very different story. Transportation, you know, dominates uh, the, the uh, petroleum use. And um, when you look at the sources of energy for electricity, you can see it's, it's still roughly half coal. We're now all, up to almost 12 percent renewables. Uh, you know, a big chunk of that uh, is, is uh, conventional hydroelectric, but the non-hydro part has been growing very, very fast. So in terms of the budget, I think for compelling reasons, the administration has said this is a place where, we, for many reasons, we want to invest. So in spite of a, a very fiscally uh, tight budget year, we've got uh, approximately a 26% increase in the request over the uh, FY12. Uh, we think we've got, got a very solid case for, uh, for the ways of spending this in ways that advance uh, not only our energy and environmental agenda, but also tied directly to any strategy for uh, economic uh, growth and recovery, particularly in manufacturing. So if I won't give you a, a, I assume that you all have copies of the budget. I won't go through this in detail. Uh, throughout this, there are difficult uh, choices that you had to make. And one of the things that we're particularly proud of is as we looked at these, each one of these programs in depth, uh, we didn't just do more of the same. We didn't just sort of uh, coast on the momentum of what we've done. We cut a lot of things out in order to add new things in. And so the growth here, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of very new things that are, the, the growth in new things is much more than 26 percent, and I'll try to walk you through some of it. Uh, we are extremely proud of the way the previous investments in ERE have actually paid off. 
Uh, this is an area where federal investment of, uh, has really driven a lot of activity in, in U.S. businesses and in job creation and has led directly to major energy savings. Now, of course, the things that you see on the market today were things that we invested in 10, 15 years ago, and they profited from a lot of private sector investment and innovation. That's where a lot of the activity came from. But we like to think that with strategic intervention on our part, doing crucial research, putting a crucial uh, a standard, we were able to really uh, drive the adoption of a lot of the things that are uh, quite, you know, are familiar with this. Uh, you know, we, efficiency of refrigerators is cut by 75%, even though the refrigerators themselves are now cheaper, bigger, and have all kinds of fancy features. Um, and we think we've got another 50%. In fact, we're sure there's another 50% we can uh, get out of that. Windows, uh, if you go back to this, if you compare the average window sold today with one that was uh, sold uh, in, the, in the late 70s or 80s, they're three times more efficient. Huge uh, uh, contribution to energy flows in buildings. Uh, and there are ones that are five times more efficient than the old, old ones. Uh, lighting is a particularly exciting place. Lighting is a very big deal. It's like 17 percent of all electricity goes into lighting. Uh, by reference, nuclear power is 20 percent of all electricity. So I mean, it's a it's a big chunk of the electricity economy. We have uh, devices out uh, in the market today. In fact, just this month, Philips has a a, a device that on on the market that's almost seven times as efficient as a conventional uh, incandescent, and we have things uh, working prototypes that are nine times as efficient. Um, so the, the batteries, uh, I won't walk you through uh, all of these things, but on the, on the side of solar, essentially the entire uh, industry went from being a device that was useful for NASA spacecraft to something that's beginning to make serious contributions uh, to American electricity supply because of the uh, constant uh, uh, research effort that we've been making over the years. Wind. Similar story, huge success. It's something like 35% of the capacity added in the last few years has been wind. It's second only to natural gas. Again, the key innovations in that field uh, that drove this enormous industry came from uh, the work that uh, was supported uh, by EERE. Um, you say, well, okay, so what have you done for us lately? Uh, it, it's always tough to turn when you have to wait 10 years for me. Oops, I just did what she told me not to do thing. I hope it's still working. <laughs> Here you go. I shouldn't wave my hand so much. Um, so in fact, I think I have just given everybody time to read this slide. But needless to say, if you have to wait 10 or 15 years for the results of research to pay off, you do have to look back a bit. But in fact, in the last few years, we have done some remarkable things with the Recovery Act. Uh, alone, we have uh, had a huge increase in the expenditures in things like weatherization uh, in batteries. The, essentially, the entire uh, battery, uh, the growth of the battery production in the, uh, in the Midwest today is a direct result of, of our intervention. But the question is, uh, so, okay, where are you going to go from here? What's, what's up? What's in this new budget? And I'll try to walk you through this. It's very, t it, one of the agonies for me is to figure out uh, what things in each one of these programs to talk about because there are a lot of fascinating things going on in each. So I'll try to give you the uh, elevator speech for a bunch of these things, but I hope we have enough time to go through some questions. Buildings, I mentioned, is a huge deal, more than 70% of electricity. Uh, where we've started a, a vigorous new program in building components. Uh, we have a, a very good solid state lighting program, but we're adding in new programs in sensors and controls in building shell materials uh, in the next generation of uh, HVAC. We're looking at the possibility of, of finding ways of, re of reinventing uh, heating and cooling equipment the same way we invent reinvented lighting. Uh, one of the things we're doing, of course, is looking at better working fluids instead of having uh, potentially uh, environmentally hazardous materials in uh, refrigerators and heat pumps uh, and air conditioners. We think we might be able to use CO2 uh, and if we're lucky, we might find there are several ideas floating around where you don't need to have uh, working fluids at all. They're completely solid state devices. They use membranes to move uh, liquid, uh, moisture across uh, uh, air flows. The key thing, of course, is not just a, a bag of components, but uh, looking at the building as a system. 
And if you compare the way energy systems are run in, say, a modern aircraft or a modern car and the way they're run in a building, it's, the, the difference is, is astounding. The sophistication of controls and feedback and sensors in, uh, the, in a car vastly exceeds what's in, a, in, in buildings. But the opportunity space is huge. And so we're trying to develop the, the ways of thinking about buildings as a whole. How do you operate them? How do you have uh, operations that are self-healing so if something goes wrong, it knows what, uh, how to fix it? We're also, of course, very interested not just in inventing stuff, but trying to get ideas, uh, these technologies, into the commercial marketplace effectively. Uh, we have uh, or, uh, an, a, a very ambitious uh, uh, appliance standard program. Our proposal is to, uh, we, we believe that just the standards we've gotten out in the last couple of years are saving uh, American consumers over $300 billion. We were playing in the FY13 plan, there's an additional uh, six uh, standards that we'll be putting in place. Um, we also have better buildings challenge, which is challenging commercial building owners to get 20% uh, more efficient. And of course, FY13 is the next year we're going to run the solar decathlon. This time it's going to be in California. Uh, so we decided that you know, since we're essentially booted off the mall, we might as well uh, think big. And we're that ran a competition uh, on where it's going to be. Vehicles. This is a, an, a, an exciting moment in vehicles because all of a sudden, instead of having essentially one fuel and one propulsion system, we're aimed at a lot of different alternatives. We really don't know in the future whether you're going to have vehicles being run on uh, gasoline or hydrogen or bio, biofuels or electricity uh, or natural gas. This, all of these things are in play, which is a, a good thing uh, because there are a lot of options. One of the things that we've, of course, concentrated on very heavily here is uh, electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. Uh, and here, the big challenge is cutting the cost of, of batteries. Uh, our goal is to get to $300 a kilowatt hour. Right, right now, we're around $600 a kilowatt hour. And we're very, very confident we're going to uh, meet that goal. There are improvements in all the battery components and in the way we manufacture batteries. But accompanying that, of course, you need to have better uh, 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 controls, electronic control systems and better motors, electric motors. Uh, a lot of the motors now have critical materials in them. You'd like to find motors that don't require any rarers. So we have a lot, a lot of work going on that. And of course, again, the uh, uh, program to try to get new innovations into the field, the Clean Cities program, continues to help states and municipalities. Uh, uh, make the regulatory changes to, and, and do other work that you need to build an infrastructure to support uh, an electric vehicle program. Well, advanced manufacturing. This used to be the Office of Industrial Programs. We brought in a guy who ran manufacturing from DARPA who has fired up a, uh, the, a concept of saying we really need, if we're going to really rebuild American manufacturing, we have to recapture innovation in manufacturing. We have to invent the, uh, the next generation of manufacturing and the next generation of materials that are going to be made in these systems. And so what you recognize if you look at the way we make stuff, we're a long way from uh, the theoretical optimum in terms of the amount of energy it needs to, to make the stuff. And if you look at uh, some of the modern uh, techniques that people are using, one of, the, one of the biggest energy users right now is separation by distillation, which is uh, uh, you know, distilling liquor is probably one of the world's oldest professions, but it's, it's a kind of silly way to separate things. You heat things up and then you cool them down. Uh, biological systems like you and me do separations all the time, but we do it at body temperature with very clever membranes that pump things. So, you know, could we do these separations at room temperature? Yeah. Uh, right now we do subtractive manufacturing, which is you take a chunk of metal and carve stuff out and have the part you want. The, another way to do this is additive manufacturing. I don't know if you've ever seen a, a 3D printer that builds things up uh, uh, just by adding the material only where it's needed. Well, it turns out you can do that with metal, powdered metallurgy. You can save a factor of 10. Uh, materials, we would love uh, to get uh, lightweight uh, and cheap carbon fiber. Right now, it only can be used in very expensive applications. We think we can make it at a price that you can afford to to use it for car parts and for wind machines. Titanium, uh, it's about as much titanium out there as uh, aluminum. Uh, 
the aluminum used to be more valuable than gold, but they found out how to make it cheaper. And now we make beer cans out of it, right? So we, we think that there's some clever ways of making titanium as cheap as aluminum, or at least in the same ballpark. And I, I'm not promising titanium beer cans, but if you do get, <laughs> if you do get it, you know, auto, you know automobiles, uh, a, a lot of other uh, products are going to uh, benefit from that. Now, in addition, again, the question is, inventing it is one thing, getting it used is another. Uh, manu advanced manufacturing for us has two uh, features. One is it's a big deal uh, in overall energy use. It's 27% of all energy. But also advanced manufacturing is essentially every other goal we've got for cutting the costs of solar cells or batteries or, uh, or wind machines. Uh, in terms of getting things out, uh, we, st we have a number of programs, the uh, Superior Energy Performance, which is trying to get the industries to use uh, the new continuous improvement standard. Uh, we have the Clean Energy Application Centers that do combined heat and power, and we're going to try to expand them so they do more. There are Better Buildings and Plants programs adding manufacturing facilities to our, uh, uh, our uh, Better Buildings program and getting people to, uh, getting industries to sign up to commitments to do long-term retrofits. And of course, the industrial assessment centers, which have been great in having universities uh, train students and go out and do real assessments on, uh, on real facilities. And could, could you hand me that? No, no, the, look. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, all right. Now, we have to do two other things that uh, are really essential to getting uh, uptake on the, particularly on buildings technologies, but also vehicle technology. One is the uh, Federal Energy Management Program that manages uh, 22 different f uh, federal agencies. It's got a goal of saving 30% of the of energy use in federal facilities uh, by, uh, uh, by use of both uh, giving them addition, new, giving them information, tracking their performance, and we have a series of of ESCOs, these uh, energy service company contracts that allow third parties to come in and finance um, the, uh, invest, the investments that you need for, uh, because many times the federal budgets don't provide the capital that you need to make the investments to save money over the long term. This is a long time complaint, but the third parties can now come in through these standard contracts. The picture up there is a uh, uh, FDA's White Oak Campus, which is, uh, is a, which has just gotten through making a $253 million ESCO that's going to retrofit the in, entire campus. It's really an, an impressive story. Then, uh, weatherization intergovernmental. This went through a real roller coaster ride. Its budget went up by uh, more than a factor of 10 during the Recovery Act. One of the big challenges we've got is to maintain the momentum that, that created a lot of businesses and jobs, and we're trying to find ways to make sure that other sources of financing can get put in place and continue this. They're a great way to get our technologies out. It turned out to be a great way to train a lot of people uh, with the talents you need. We're now up to something, uh, I think it was 830,000 houses have been retrofit uh, since 2009 uh, with the weatherization and other programs. It's been a, a difficult uh, transition, you say, well, gee, we, we're going to end up retrofitting a million houses. Well, that's great, but there are 219 million more that have to be retrofit. So it's, you know, we're really at the beginning of this and, and not at the end. So that's the 90, it's a quick tour through where does the energy go. Uh, obviously, you still don't want to, uh, we think that energy efficiency is in almost every case the most cost effective way uh, to uh, meet our energy challenges. There's still going to be a need for energy, uh, and we have a, a number of uh, ways that we can uh, contribute to that solution. Solar, of course, is, is extremely attractive uh, since if you can get it cheap enough, uh, it can scale from rooftops to giant uh, facilities covering uh, sections of the desert. Uh, throughout I mean, this uh, talk, I, I should have mentioned at the beginning, our main goal, the big, best way to get stuff taken up by the market is to make it cheap enough so it competes by itself with no subsidy. And that's uh, the goal of every one of our renewable programs. Here, uh, we're, we have a project called Sunshot, trying to get the cost of installed PV at the utility scale down to a dollar a watt. And uh, we think we can do it. We're on track to do it. I think we were a little scared when it started off, saying that we could actually get do this. 
but the costs of the arrays are coming down. One of the biggest challenges facing us now is the cost of installing uh, these things. You can spend something like 50 cents a watt just going through the paperwork, permitting, uh, inspections, and other things to get a facility in. So we're not going to get to a dollar a watt if you spend that much on paperwork. So we have a, a number of uh, ways of challenging local communities uh, to find ways to facilitate that permitting and, and inspection. Wind, uh, as I said, it's a huge commercial operation, one of our success stories. Uh, we've, got a lot, we've got a ways to go on improving it, but this, this, the industry itself has taken up the challenge. Our job is to be at the edge of what's possible, and we believe one of the most attractive new things we can do here is to uh, go offshore. Offshore wind is strong, it's steady, it's close to population centers, and it's really, really expensive. But uh, we, we are convinced that we can uh, really drive down the, the price of uh, offshore wind through innovation. Uh, yesterday, we just issued a big uh, opportunity announcement for innovative offshore wind. We're expecting some really amazing creative uh, ideas in on this. And of course, it's one of the, it's, it's, it's attractive to a lot of states along the coast, both East Coast, West Coast, Gulf, and uh, the Great Lakes, particularly port cities, because you may, uh, some of these concepts involve building the stuff in a port and towing it out and, uh, and anchoring it offshore. Geothermal, uh, uh, one of the, there are two problems in geothermal that we've, that we've uh, pinpointed by looking at uh, holding workshops. One is there's a lot of hydrothermal workshop, out, uh, hydrothermal resources out there, but the easy to find ones have been found. The ones with no surfing expressions are, are hard to find. We think we've got some really cool tools for finding those. Uh, but the bonanza is if you can get to the hot, rocks that are deep underneath almost all parts of the country. Again, what you want to do is to do something that looks like fracking, but it's very deep under high pressures and high temperatures, and all the equipment that works well in shale just dissolves when you're trying to use it at that depth. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to start up some uh, 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 test sites one or more test sites where people, where we can designate them as test sites, bring people in, let them test equipment, uh, let them try to understand the geology of different places. This is something that the industry has come, come to us repeatedly asking for. FY13, we want to make that happen. And then finally, water. Uh, we've done a lot of work on uh, conventional hydro, uh, fish-friendly turbines. Uh, we've got turbines that now make electricity and not sushi. It, it's, uh, you get the turbines that will allow 98% of the fish to actually get through these things. One of the exciting things is, is the marine and hydrokinetic uh, technologies, which are, uh, you, know, you know, tidal, run of the river, uh, waves, and, uh, uh, and these other techniques. We are in the process right now of putting a lot of these things actually in the water, running cost models. We really don't know what these things cost. Uh, but we will, and uh, we'll be able to move uh, smartly forward in 2013. Anyway, that's the, uh, the quick overview of this. Uh, the, uh, the, the shut up sign was just hoisted here, so I will take the cue uh, and be very happy to um, uh, answer any of your questions. But needless to say, we think we've got a lot of really uh, fascinating and exciting things that are both uh, intellectually challenging and crucial for the country. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Henry. And um, his presentation, as I said, we will post on uh, EESI's website uh, later this afternoon. And so that um, I know that it, this would have been really difficult, if not impossible, to, to see, but uh, we will make that available. I'm uh, delighted to be able to turn to Fred Sassine, who is a longtime energy policy specialist uh, for the uh, but it's true, Fred, a very long time, right? Uh, uh, in the Resources Science and Industry Division at the Congressional Research Service. And I think that um, so many people all over the Hill have depended upon Fred, his work, his response to just immediate requests uh, for, for years. And so we are very glad to have Fred with us again this year to talk about uh, the budget from uh, a CRS perspective.
Thank you, Carol. Um, <clears throat> since I'm turning 39 next week, I don't know that it could have been that long that I've been here. But uh, anyway, good afternoon, everyone. Well, Dr. Kelly certainly presented the complete picture of the 2013 request. The humble goal of this presentation is to give another view of the request. The slides are focused on just a few highlights of the new initiatives. You can see that the handout contains 30 slides, but don't worry, I'm only going to cover about half of them. I will do this in 15 minutes or less. Carol. The other slides provide some further background and references that you may find handy. After today's panel, if you have any questions about the budget, please feel free to call or email me. My contact information is shown on the last page of the handout. However, before I start the presentation, I need to make a disclaimer. As you may know, all CRS analysts have a firm responsibility to be neutral and unbiased. Thus, I must divulge the state of my knowledge on DOE's budget. Many of you know Will Rogers, that famous commentator from the 1930s. He was once asked about his insights about government policy. He famously admitted, and I paraphrase here, all he knew was what he had read in the newspapers. So I have a similar confession about my remarks today. All I know is what I read in the DOE budget request. <clears throat> Thus, if you have any tough or penetrating questions, please direct them to Henry, not to me. <laughs> but we have a tight time limit, so I will shoot straight ahead in a quest to follow the money, or more specifically, what I tried to emphasize in this handout is proposed changes in funding. Okay, to get started, let's note that the slide numbers are shown on the bottom right-hand corner of each page. Let's start with slide number three, entitled Overview. Slide three shows that the total DOE request would go up 856 million, or about 3%. EERE would go up about 458 million, or about half of the agency total. Compared with the FY 2012 EERE appropriation, this would be an increase of about 25%. You may want to note that EERE increase would, in principle, be partially offset by the administration's broader request to reduce tax subsidies for fossil energy. If congressional staff need more information about that tax proposal, please contact CRS analyst Molly Sherlock. Slide four shows the FY 2013 EERE emphasis. The focus is on transformation to a clean energy economy, basically the same focus as last year. The three main rationales for the transformation are competitiveness, climate change, and reduced oil imports. Slide seven describes the basis for funding calculations shown in later slides. Please note that all funding changes shown follow those in the DOE request. The differences are calculated between the 2013 request and the 2012 appropriation. Slide eight describes the new sub-program account structure that DOE applies to all EERE technology programs. This will help you find your way through this budget document. The four sub-programs are innovations, emerging technologies, systems integration, and market barriers. They are sequential, following the technology development progression from research to development, then demonstration and deployment. Each sub-program is identified with technology readiness levels, or TRLs, that range from one for basic research to 10 for market commercialization. Slide nine shows that the request would provide about $500 million worth of increased funding over five areas. There's four technology programs, manufacturing, vehicles, buildings, and biomass, and also for the weatherization grant program. Those are the big five. Slide 10 shows another 82 million of increases for strategic programs and for geothermal and solar technology programs. Slide 11 shows about 62 million in cuts for water power technologies and the hydrogen program. 
These 2013 cuts parallel similar cuts that DOE proposed for 2012. For both programs, DOE notes that the major projects are reaching completion or are otherwise undergoing plan phase downs during 2012. So that's why they don't need um, steady funding or even increased funding. Slide 12 lists the key themes for EERE technology programs that underlie the major requested increases. Slide 13 lists the three innovation hubs for which money is sought in 2013. I could not find a breakout for the materials hub, so that figure is a guess based on discussion in the request and based on the fact that most DOE requests for hubs have been set at about 20 million per year. Slide 14 presents an overview of the initiatives proposed for the Advanced Manufacturing Office. The AMO is a transformation of the former Industrial Technologies Program. The largest EERE funding initiatives are proposed for sub-programs under this office. These 2013 initiatives parallel manufacturing initiatives proposed in DOE's 2012 request. However, the 2013 initiatives appear to involve less funding, more focus, and more specifics. Slide 15 shows the AMO increase for 2013 broken down by the old account structure. Clearly, the bulk of the increase would go to manufacturing processes. The figure for materials is roughly the amount that would be expected to support another year of the critical materials hub. Also note that the activities and funding increase for industrial technical assistance would be identical to that for the market barrier subprogram under the new structure. So that's an easy one to see the correspondence between the two. Slide 16 shows AMO increases broken down by the new account structure. Clearly, the bulk of the funding increase would go to activities under the two subprograms, emerging technologies and systems integration. Slide 17 presents a description and examples of manufacturing process initiatives under emerging technologies. The focus would be on new technology and computer simulation tools to reduce and or integrate the number of steps in industrial processes and to discover alternatives alternative processes. One area given as an example involves the development and application of sensors and controls to reduce energy losses from industrial motors, steam, and process heating activities. Another area given as an example, biomanufacturing, I think Henry mentioned this, involves using plants as a platform or medium to support the production of feedstocks that could be converted to oil substitutes. Slide 18 presents a description and examples of manufacturing process initiatives under systems integration. The focus would be on addressing technical risk by identifying production scale capability and system level issues. Public-private partnerships would involve project competitions and provide access to specialized technology for small and medium-sized firms. Examples of DOE's candidate projects include high quality composite curing, three-dimensional layering, which Henry mentioned earlier, and reduced material loss, which I think Henry referred to earlier in regard to uh, titanium. Slide 19 presents a description and examples of initiatives for the next generation materials program. The requested increase would aim for technological breakthroughs to achieve high function and performance, improve thermal and degradation resistance, and major cost reductions. One example is given as low density materials for rotating parts in hubs and gears, which would increase design opportunities for wind turbines and for cars. Another example is given as high temperature and rust resistant steels that could bypass critical materials and cut costs. Slide 20 shows some highlights of the vehicles program increase. The largest increase would support the electric vehicle grand challenge, which is aimed at accelerating work on advanced batteries, power electronics, and charging stations. This activity would focus on developments under the current sub-program 
for batteries and electric drive technology. Slide 21 on buildings lists a new goal to reduce the operational energy use of newly constructed buildings by 50% by the year 2030. The main funding increases would be, uh, would support accelerated work on equipment standards and building codes. It would support retrofit demonstrations, would launch new activities in areas such as solid state lighting and HVAC, and extend funding to operate the innovation hub for building efficiency design. In general, you should note that the program aims to overcome several persistent long-term barriers. These barriers include industry structure, high first costs that are separated from operational cost savings, and market information failures, as well as other problems. Slide 22 on biomass emphasizes a $52 million increase for biorefinery plant demonstrations. DOE says this would support the construction and operation phases for biofuels, such as cellulosic ethanol and renewable diesel. Other increases would support feedstock conversion to solid pellets or to green crude and propel other technologies for bio, oil, and algae dewatering. Also, please note uh, that DOE seeks conditional authority from Congress to transfer $100 million from the EER appropriation to the Defense Production Act Fund. The money would be used in the joint DOE defense and um, agriculture department activities focused on drop-in biofuel development for military applications. More specifically, it would involve pilot scale demonstrations for production of renewable diesel and jet fuel to be used by the Navy. Slide 23 provides further context for the EERE technology initiatives. It lists some historical issues involving the purposes and costs of demonstration projects, which are now under the systems integration subprogram. Uh, this in the past has been usually the most debated aspects of uh, DOE's applied research programs. Also, there are five slides, numbers 24 through 28, that present historical context for the funding history of the four major energy technologies, nuclear, fossil, renewables, and efficiency. From FY 2011 through FY 23, through the FY23 request, the relative funding order for these technologies, nuclear, renewables, efficiency, and fossil, is mostly stable. The big picture history is also interesting. Slide 28 gives a long-term view of federal support for energy technologies. The relative proportions reflect the fact that long before DOE existed, large federal investments went to nuclear and fossil energy technologies. For congressional staff, slide 30 presents some references to CRS reports on DOE energy funding. And uh, time permitting, I have one more statement about a very important administrative item. After last year's EESI presentation on DOE's budget, we asked Carol if there was some way that all of the participants, all of you out there, and the presenters could be rewarded. Carol said she could buy all of us a round of champagne at the local pub. <laughs> so who wants to hold Carol to that promise today? Let's have a show of hands. Thank you. As you know, what they say with biofuels is drink the best, burn the rest, right? We now will turn to our third speaker, who also brings a wealth of experience, more long-time experience. And uh, Scott Sklar has been working in the energy technology and policy area for uh, a few decades, uh, like our other presenters today, and he uh, is the chair of the steering committee of the Sustainable Energy Coalition, uh, our partner organization, and he also is the president of the Stella Group and is doing a lot of technology um, system work in the efficiency and uh, renewable energy 
uh, arenas in, in terms of really looking at how these things all really work together. And I think all of that is really important, again, as we think about efficiency and renewables and how all of these, um, the, the multiple sectors and technologies really can be, need to be looked at as systems and how that is really how we get our optimal performance. Scott? Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. My, as you can see, my company, I blend all these efficiency and renewable energy technologies all over the world for Fortune 500 companies and including the U.S. military. And I also teach an interdisciplinary course at George Washington University uh, on sustainable energy. Now, next slide, please. Um, I, I just want to say before we start on this budget that the private sector itself is putting in a lot of money in the energy efficiency and renewable energy world. So as you can see from the top one, uh, Pew Charitable Trust, $243 billion of private sector investments. That's just in renewables. If you look at the Bloomberg for 2009, they had $336 billion, uh, 0.78, and that's for renewable storage and high value energy efficiency. Private sector only, globally. So we're talking into the hundreds of billions of dollars. If you add government investments around the world in renewable energy and efficiency, it's a, it's a little over $600 billion. So we're getting at the trillion dollar mark per year for these technologies. So I don't want you to think that everything that's happening investment is coming from the government sector by far. Next, please. Um, if you took my course, I see Andrew here, so he did this and kept his hair. If you took my course, you would have a list of 24 studies that have been done in the last three and a half years that shows the United States or the world could meet most or all of its energy from high value energy efficiency and renewable energy sustainably. There are no studies you can do that with traditional energy. And you know, I hear all this about fracking. I have no problem with natural gas that we'll have a, we have 100 years of gas, you know, by doing this, my grandmother lived more than 100 years. So it sounds like a long time, it's really not. So these technologies are sustainable. And I had my grad student interns have to read all those studies. You don't have to, thank goodness. And they took the most conservative estimates from all of them to look at what the blend of the United States would be. And these are existing commercial technologies now. And you can see the blend, again, include, this includes the high value energy efficiency of the biomass of the buildings of the geothermal, this concentrated solar, the distributed solar, waste heat, water energy, and wind energy. It takes a portfolio to drive, uh, quote, some kind of comprehensive energy strategy. Next, please. And this is the study that was done by the Institute of Local Self-Reliance a year and a half ago, which basically say 32 states in the United States have an, uh, retrievable, economically retrievable resources to meet their energy needs. And most of those 32 states are huge oversupply, meaning they could deal with the other 18 states that can only meet a portion from the renewable resources they have. So there's an immense amount of resource capability in the United States uh, here. And by the way, uh, this study did not talk about the marine technologies, which I will talk about shortly. Next, please. Um, the uh, Energy Information Administration, February 29th, 2012, so we're right in this year, uh, said that electric generation increased by 55%. And so, uh, and if you read the out of the, the Sustainable Energy Network, we put out press releases that talk about um, renewables now have exceeded uh, nuclear output uh, per year in the United States. So this is a growing set for investment as well as energy generation. Next, please. Um, and so that's again, next one. Sorry, that's a double slide somehow. So I wanted to highlight the two decreases because that is part of my job here to whine slightly. And there's nothing like a fine wine, W-H-I-N-E. So I want to uh, have you all realize something, that every administration and every budget out of the U.S. Department of Energy since the beginning, 
and I, I worked up here since the, that beginning, um, uh, threw a technology or two overboard to show they were fiscally prudent. And this budget has done the exact same thing. So the, the awardees this time to show fiscal prudence but not smart technology prudence is the water energy uh, R&D budget. And you can see uh, the, that the uh, $58.7 million in investment, uh, the request is $20 million. Now I need to give you some history and I need to give you some background. First of all, there have been several studies and the one I like the most is the EPRI study which showed that we can meet 10% of U.S. energy needs conservatively through non-dammed water technologies, plural. And that is free flow hydro, tidal wave, ocean currents, and ocean thermal. So 10%. And by the way, I believe that's conservatively. And the other issue is this is 24-hour power, uh, no carbon emissions, no waste, and um, most of the people in the world live near water. Think about that. So that's where your population centers tend to be, on the coast or on rivers. So, and what we're trying to do with this program is focus on, it was used to call the hydropower program, and focus on the mature hydro industry, and through a bipartisan effort in Congress, through a bipartisan effort in Congress, starting in the last term of the Bush administration and in this administration, we had been able to push to expand this program to all the water technologies and to focus not, as we usually do, on just technology efficiency, but how to make the technologies compatible with the many uses of the, of the water resource. And those many uses are obviously environmental, marine life, and other things that share the water, uh, shipping, recreation, all the things we use water for. So we're actually a little uh, premonition on how we smartly develop technology uh, than what we did have done sometimes before. So to uh, cut a program where the rest of the world is putting in $8 billion a year and the leaders are Britain, Spain, Australia, Japan, and for now the U.S. Uh, in these technologies, plural. And we have some real stars in technology, particularly in the tidal and wave, and I've actually a couple of ocean current companies here in the United States who are spending lots of time and money with demo projects on both, so on both shores to push this forward. So to give this up because it's expedient is nice, but it is not mature technology. It is totally new. It is very important to meet security, climate, environmental, whatever. And we, if we're going to do it, and it's going to evolve on its own, we ought to do it in the, in the most smartest way, again, both to protect environment and the multi-resource that we all enjoy and also be able to get energy. Next one, please. Next one, uh, oh, this is the hydropower uh, budget uh, the, from the water pr program budget history. And you can see uh, the budget was minimal starting at 2006 and before. And then it started moving up in 2008, 9, 10, a little dip in 11, and up in 12. And, and really that up in 12 was coming back to Congress bipartisanly to drive this up. This is an important sector. It is not being taken frankly, as seriously, by, nor staffed as seriously by the department, we need to correct that. Next, please. Um, hydrogen is the other one that's sort of been thrown over the boat. Now, hydrogen, I want to remind you, hydrogen is a storage technology. It is a, it is a medium. It is like electricity. And there are different ways you can get hydrogen, uh, create hydrogen, uh, move hydrogen around, uh, formats you can store hydrogen in, and then places you can utilize hydrogen. And that could be in transportation and electric generation. I've done some electric generation projects. I actually have a hydrogen fuel cell in my zero energy office building in Arlington, Virginia. So uh, th this one gets uh, dumped down as well. And, um, 
And you know, it's a, it's a complex play, but the issue is storage is the holy grail of energy. And you know, for a while, the Department of Energy really wasn't an advanced battery technology. Now it is. And it's doing good work primarily through the ARPA-E program. And of course, DARPA and Defense is doing great work with it as well, as is the National Science Foundation. Hydrogen is another storage technology. Uh, compressed air and liquids are a third. Pumped hydro is a fourth. Flywheels is a fifth. A thermal salts and advanced thermal storage is a sixth. We need to be able to store and use energy that is more efficient, that's closer to energy efficiency than it is with generation. It is cheaper to store and move and utilize than it is to generate. And we need smart grids, smart transportation systems. Storage is essential. So again, to throw this over because it was created on under some old programs and, and different plays actually is a mistake. The world leaders in hydrogen, frankly, are Japan, uh, India is moving into a, an advanced stage, South Korea uh, and, and Chinese are, are, are swarming on this. This is something for us to look at. It is a critical issue. We should not give it up just for ceremonial throwing over. Next, please. Um, Bill Gates, in February 2012, said uh, the lack of energy funding is crazy. And it is true. And I want you to, I want to leave this briefing with a thought for you. How are we going to compete globally without reducing our input costs to manufacturing? All right? You can't do it with labor. We will never compete on labor with Chinese or anyone else. It's going to work. We're an industrialized country. And commodities, metal, steel, cement, glass, are global commodities. They are set in global markets. The way you compete is advanced R&D and manufacturing technology, and that's where the budget is good. The administration's proposal for advanced manufacturing is excellent. And then the other one is to reduce the inputs of energy and water. Those are the inputs that we can control. If we can manufacture something for half the energy and half the water, we win. And if we have a better material process to use less materials to make it, that's advanced manufacturing, we win. Usually it's not going to be one or the other. It's going to be the team of inputs to be able to do it. So we need to be smart about that if we want to be competitive. The other issue I want to lay out, in the building section of the U.S. Department of Energy, they have walked away or closed the Zero Energy Buildings Program. This was the place they integrated, and Dr. Kelly is correct, a good portion of energy goes towards buildings, the high value energy efficiency and all the different renewable technologies they, that can be. In fact, I have standing there a piece of glass. I'm going to take it, pick it up right here. Thank you, Fred, for this technical assistance, <laughs> which is smart building glass with nanotechnology photovoltaics embedded in it. So it has the, all the insulative and low-E coatings that, we're, that are the cutting edge of technology, and the glass also produces electricity for big buildings, all right? So, the issue is each of these programs go on their little way, and the part of the deal is we want to do what Apple does. We want elegant integration of technology. It provides better cost, uh, better economics, ease of use. So we need to start promoting this whole approach and revive some of this interdisciplinary R&D so that while we're dealing with the little parts, the tires in the car, the engines of the car, the windows on the car, that maybe the whole system, the car, ought to be better. And I'm using that as the analogy, of course. Lastly and finally, these budget issues can be very, very complex. But the issue is we are in a global competition for these technologies. I hope we don't wind up in what I call, uh, you know, um, the whole VCR syndrome where the very technologies we've created, we import. So right now, we have a lot of the IP in these technologies. We are still a global leader in these technologies, believe it or not. 
But again, it is critical for us to sustain the investment and make sure the entire portfolio of energy efficiency for renewable energy is taken seriously and considered. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. I think every, every year as we look at the budget, we recognize that there are immense challenges in terms of choices and looking at how to best push goals, ideas further, and at the same time, uh, what is also the best way to think about providing the kind of assistance to move forward on deployment. Um, in, in terms of looking at all of the um, uh, technology development uh, and, uh, you know, that, that has been done and now needs to make it uh, into the market or, or to be deployed at much larger scales. And so there's always some tension and particularly when there uh, seemingly are very, very constrained budgets. And as Scott said, uh, we are looking at huge investments that are being made in the private sector and also by nations around the world who all recognize that energy is a huge, huge game changer in terms of how we use it and how it affects everything that we do. So let's open it up for your questions and comments. And if you could just identify yourself when you ask your question. Okay, here first. All I can say is that the budget that we submitted is consistent with it. I don't know that, it, I must say, I don't know the details. My part of the universe was to put together the budget with the grants we had. So we, uh, you know, the, the budget as a whole obviously conforms to the Budget Control Act. By the way, one thing I need to, to set the record clear, I forgot to show two, the slide on biomass and a slide on hydrogen. I just, for the record, I want to say it's not because I don't, I ran, ran out of love, but I ran out of time. So. <laughs> But that's the kind of question we ask of CBO. <laughs> right. That they, would, they would probably be able to answer that. I should be more familiar with that than I am, but that, you know, our goal is to, the, right now the price is $600 a kilowatt hour. We, we think we can get down to, yeah, this, this, so you need to work on the anode, the cathode, and the electrolyte. I think that that innovation was on the cathode. Uh, but you do have, you, you need work on the entire battery. Uh, but we think that we can probably push lithium ion down, and this is like, we think we can get to $300 by 2014, 2015. And this technology is one of the things that was in the pipeline when we made the, that forecast. Uh, we'd still like to go a lot lower. Uh, and if you, beyond lithium ion, there, there's another whole generation of metal air, lithium air, zinc air, where we think we can get down to uh, much, you know, maybe down to $120 a, a kilowatt hour. But, uh, you know, this technology that came out of Argonne is, is great. It's one of the things we need to be on the, the trajectory. There's a, fortunately, there's a whole portfolio of things that are coming out now. And a lot of private sector money and a lot of, uh, lot of innovation in, in, in the battery industry. Actually, ma manufacturing these things at scale is one of the things that our manufacturing guys are trying to help with. Uh, can I, Carol, can I just say, uh, I do want to point out there are probably about 100 companies in the United States with very advanced battery technology coming out. Uh, as Dr. Kelly said, lithium ion is one of the plays, but we have carbon supercapacitor batteries being manufactured now with very, very long lives and, uh, and can take uh, high heat and cold. And I think the price points that, that Dr. Kelly said is right in terms of where we need to go down to. I don't see anything in the way except, you know, investment dollars and, uh, and entrepreneur ingenuity. But you know, there's, um, 
I would say about $60 billion of the private sector money going into advanced batteries, you know, deep cycle uh, batteries, both for vehicles and, and grid inter interaction in some way. One at a time to do that. Uh, I don't have a I don't have a quick answer for you. Maybe we could follow up afterwards to talk about it. We will we will be you know, we have rolled that up. It's, the, the, the different, there's not a huge difference. You know we're trying to but moving things to these TRLs it makes it a lot easier for us to do that kind of analysis you're talking about. To identify where it is in the process. And in fact, it's probably in this book, but it'll take me a while to find it. Other questions? Can you address some of the chat's comments on the test of the water power program and what was the rationale behind that? Uh, it's usually my policy not to argue with people with beards, but I will uh, <laughs> try to do my best. I think you should keep that up. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, on the uh, conventional hydro side, which is where some of the bigger decreases took place, actually, um, we think that the, this is not a technology problem right now. It's a regulatory permitting siting problem. And, uh, you know, while we're, we can help with that, there are a lot of other federal agencies that have got the action in that area. I think that it's not, a, it's, there's, not a, there's not an R&D play that's going to be really important. These, this next generation of turbines that we came out with uh, recently, including this fish-friendly turbine, uh, allow you to achieve very high efficiencies in an environmentally uh, responsible way. Now the problem is to get uh, the permission to use them. Uh, we are, because of the, the uh, significant increase in FY12 budget over 11, we were able to actually, we're, we're putting our, our emphasis this year in gathering data from the, uh, uh, from these experiments that are out in the field. And I said one of the, one of the big problems here is to find out how much this stuff costs. You know, our goal again is, is sort of obsessively trying to do, you know, invest in things that can actually com compete. And the cost estimates for a lot of these uh, very innovative technologies are hard to nail down. We, by the end of this fiscal year, we think we'll have really good, uh, you know, cents per kilowatt hour estimates for five or six of these most promising technologies. And so the, the thought was to try to get the, the data in place, put together, and, you know, figure out how to, how to move the program forward, but that FY13 was not the place to be, uh, you know, investing, uh, making a lot of big investment decisions in there. But, you know, we will, I'm always pleased to get uh, opposing opinions and we can uh, debate it. So the budget request for next year for the following fiscal year might look very different with regard to if, if some of these look like they're economic, the test is, you know, is there a lot of it out there, a lot of resource out there at, at a cheap price? Then you go forward. You get a bright green light. Okay. Uh, two questions here and then Matt Finish out with the National Hydropower Association. Uh, following up on this question about the uh, hydropower and heat pads, uh, you talk a lot about the conventional hydropower projects, and that's where, or conventional hydropower research mm -hmm. development, and that's where the majority of the cuts are. Mm -hmm. and you said that, or I believe Mr. Sassine said that the uh, major projects are winding down, but that doesn't necessarily speak to the objectives of the program, such as reducing the cost of small hydropower technologies where a lot of that will go to building on existing infrastructure. Um, can you speak to, or have the objectives been met? Have things like the cost been brought down in technology? Well, we did support a, a, a fair number of low-head hydro, uh, run-of-the-river hydro that could be put in at small scale. They are also in the category of, you know, we're going to need to get a year or so of data from those experiments and find out uh, what, you know, shape our programs around some hard evidence. Right now, though, there, there are a lot of promising things that are cost effective today that aren't moving. And we're trying to move, work with our regula regulatory colleagues to get those things uh, underway. But it's not primarily an R&D barrier in many of these cases. So. Yes, my name is Robert Robinson. I'm with BC Solar United Nations. In the U.S., with the densest uh, penetration of solar in the United States, that doesn't mean we have more of it. It means it's denser here. One of the problems with energy budgets, it seems to me, is that because there is a lack of acceptance of these things within the public, uh, it makes it harder and harder to get support for, at the budget level. So I'm wondering why the U.S. Department of Energy doesn't do more to encourage 
end user support for alternative energies generally. It's extremely difficult in the United States um, to get things through the welter of legislative, regulatory, and financial requirements uh, that jurisdictions have to face if they want to embrace alternative energies. Thank you. Well, I, I, I think I said in my remarks that one of the th we've looked very hard at particularly the barriers to, to photovoltaic installations, and we actually and there, there's a giant difference around the country between jurisdictions. Uh, we found that the time it takes to get a permit in San Diego, from the time you apply to, for a permit to time you're through all of the inspections and everything in San Diego is less than two weeks. In New York City, it's 18 months. It takes four pages just to explain the processes. So we actually have put together a, uh, a project with a very clever name, which I can't remember at the moment. But it, it was a competition among communities to try to find ways to benchmark their processes just have long and to uh, pledge to go through and try to meet a, the, a, a goal of, of vastly cutting the time and, and complexity of going through this process. Uh, we had enth really enthusiastic, and then they're going to exchange best practices. They're going to te basically teach each other how to do this got really good applications. Uh, we got, we funded projects in cities that uh, cover 51 million uh, people in the country. So they're big systems that are now competing in this. The first stage is to benchmark it and find out what the current system looks like. At the end of the year, we hope to have some really uh, solid solutions, including things that have actually gone through uh, city governments and, and, uh, and, and permitting authorities and actually try to fix this. Uh, yeah, the, the other thing the Department of Energy done is they have an ongoing training program through the state energy offices for code officials. And we get a lot of pushback on the different code officials because they don't understand what this stuff is. So it's trying to create education programs and they've done some very creative things around them. And, you know, I don't know how much, and you probably know better that a lot of that hasn't trickled into D.C., but we might want to uh, take a look at what's been done in some of the other uh, uh, municipalities and, and, and try to drag it in here so we can drag the nation's capital in the 21st century. How about that? It's the rooftop solar challenge. The only other thing I want to mention is uh, I know that EPA used to have, it's, it was a modest program, but a state local uh, program and I know that they supported groups like ICLE, if you're familiar with ICLE. Uh, Very much so to support energy efficiency and renewable energy at the local level? They're, they're not dealing with end users. And state and local governments frequently are not proponents uh, of renewable energy. Oh. No, they're ch it's changing really fast. That's an intriguing thing. So. Right, right. I think so in terms of certainly a lot of state energy offices that we've dealt with historically that we're seeing a lot of What, if any, impact will the proposed budget have on state and tribal energy plans? Well, we say the question again. Well, state and um, tribal energy plans. Yeah. Impact. What, if any, impact will this proposed budget have on state and tribal? I, energy I think plans? the funding's level is like well, it, million dollars or something. This is a very complicated problem because the Recovery Act um, led to a huge increase in many of these programs. Some of the states did not end up spending their money as fast as other states. So what we've gotten is the ability to reallocate the Recovery Act money with the new appropriation so that people will come out whole. And so it'll, it will look much more like a normal year than last year, for example. So they're, they're, you know, they will be, they will, they may, everybody may not get what they want, but it'll be much more like a typical year for, uh, you know, weatherization, state, local, and tribal programs. So so that's state. What about uh, the effect on tribal uh, energy plans, if any? As far as I know, it's... Well, if there's $6 million <coughs> in, the, in your budget for tribal energy programs, yeah. I think it's $41 mm -hmm. for, for state, which is down a million from last year's yeah. 
but tribal is level, I think. Yeah, tribal is level. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, I found it. Okay. Um, tribal energy, seven million in uh, 2011, 10 million in 2012 enacted, and back to seven for 2013 requests. So it is down a little bit. It's down from 12. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, other questions? Comments? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, Henry, um, I'm Andrew Seal from George Washington University, actually, in Scott's class. Um, I was just wondering if you could just take a moment to discuss Scott's closing point about uh, kind of the VCR phenomenon. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the very lively debate on uh, PV modules uh, that even when you